Have you ever met someone and known instantly that they are the one for you? I wish I'd realized sooner so that my teenage years hadn't been so full of drama and heartbreak. But you live and learn, right? And better late than never. By the way, I'm Versalise, and I'm 24 years old. It all began 14 years ago when I moved to New York and started at a new school. At that time, I assumed that moving from my hometown in France to New York would be no big deal. My mom and I were super excited and truly believed it would change our lives. Indeed, it did, but not in the ways I ever expected. On my first day at my new school, my mother insisted on driving me to school. When we arrived, I gave my mom a kiss on both of her cheeks and waved goodbye. My mom joked that she'd sort out any of the kids who dared to mess with me. I did feel quite shy, but I thought she was just joking. Turns out she wasn't. At lunchtime, I sat down at a random table, and suddenly this girl appeared and said, What do you think you're playing at, sitting at our table? I didn't even have time to reply before she picked up my lunch tray and threw it off the table right into the trash can. I said, move, she said. Everyone was staring at us now. I was so upset, I just covered my face. I didn't want to be that crybaby in front of all these new people, but I couldn't help it. The tears started falling. Then something crazy happened. A voice boomed out through the cafeteria, saying, Get away from her! And then the next moment, I felt a hand reach out for my hand, and when I looked up, this gorgeous tall boy was standing there looking at me when he picked me up on my feet. Excuse me, the girl started, but the boy continued, What is wrong with you? Do you have a screw loose or something? Your attitude is so gross. It'll make me puke. You disgust me, and I don't want to be friends with someone like you. She stood there with her mouth wide open as he grabbed my hand and walked away. I could hear her scoff from behind me, but her facial expression looked as if she'd lost. I took his hand and followed him out of the cafeteria, and that's when he introduced himself as Ryder. We sat down outside, and he asked me if I was new around here, and then he told me he loved my accent. And he even offered me half of his baguette and said, Hey, come on, chin up. I'll be your friend, okay? The best part is that the girl who bullied me had a major crush on him, so she was probably even angrier at me now. But I didn't care one bit. After that, I can't remember a time when we were apart. We were glued at the hip and did everything together. He taught me how to skateboard, and I taught him how to bake my famous pastries. We were like the dream team. He made me laugh so much, and he helped me become more confident. Day by day, I could tell I wanted to be more than just his friend, but I didn't dare tell him that. Then my 12th birthday rolled around, and my mom gave me a diary. She told me to write down all of my thoughts, and even my crushes so that I could reflect back on it one day. Then she winked at me and walked away. Ew, what was she talking about? I didn't have a crush. Did I? Okay, who am I kidding? I had the biggest crush ever on Ryder. Every time I saw him, I felt like there were a million butterflies in my stomach, and I woke up excited every day because I knew I'd get to see him. And then the time came for our school dance, and my friends were teasing me that I should go with Ryder. I kept telling them he was just my friend, but I couldn't fool them. They saw right through me. Later that day, Ryder invited me over to play video games, and as we were playing, he said, Hey, um, want to go to the dance with me? I couldn't believe it. My heart was thumping in my chest, but I tried to play it cool and said, Uh, sure, I guess. And you know what? We had the best time ever at the dance. I was for sure on cloud nine, and afterwards I decided to journal about it in my diary. I never wanted to forget that night. So, I wrote pages upon pages of how Ryder made me feel and how I loved him so much. Little did I know how everything was about to change. A few days later, Ryder came over to my house, and as soon as I saw him, I had the biggest grin on my face. But quickly that grin faded when Ryder said he had something to tell me. I have some bad news. My family and I are moving to London in a month. This is a joke, right? Come on, stop playing around. I said, trying to hide the worry in my voice, but he just stayed quiet, and by then I knew he wasn't joking. I couldn't hold back the tears, and Ryder just reached out and held me in his arms, comforting me. 
He told me it would be okay, and we'd still keep in touch, but I felt like my whole world was crumbling around me. This was the worst news of my life. We decided to make our last month together the most fun we'd ever had. We went surfing, skateboarding, stargazing, and even did karaoke. I never wanted that month to end, but of course, it did. On our last night together, we had a slumber party and stayed up all night waiting for the sun to rise. When it came time to say goodbye, he gave me a framed photo of the two of us and said if I ever felt sad, I could just look at it and remember the happy times. I wanted to tell him how I felt, but I couldn't, and so he left. I was so down that I ran upstairs and covered myself under the blanket and cried. Later that night, as usual, I was about to write my day in my diary when it was nowhere to be seen. I shouted at my mom and blamed her, but she just said I must have misplaced it. Now I had no writer and no diary. My life sucked. Summer quickly ended and it was time for high school. Even though I had my friends, my life wasn't the same without Ryder. But life goes on, and so eventually I tried to move on from Ryder. My friends told me that this guy Lucas had always had a crush on me, and maybe I should give him a chance. Well, soon we started dating, and even though I didn't have the same special connection with him as I had with Ryder, it was still fun, and it took my mind off of things. Fast forward seven years, and Lucas and I were still together. The relationship wasn't great, but I had my dream job and was living in my dream loft apartment, so I couldn't complain too much. Plus, Ryder had drifted away from my mind. I decided it was time to really put some work into my relationship with Lucas. So one night, I told him I was working late and booked us a surprise trip to Paris. When I got home, I was so excited to tell Lucas, so I ran up to our bedroom, and to my complete horror, I found him lying in our bed kissing another girl. They didn't even notice me at first. So I screamed, what are you doing? Well, that got their attention, and the girl ran off. I thought Lucas would apologize, but he just said, what do you expect? You won't give me what I want, and you make me wait for marriage. Then he stomped out of the room and said, I can have any girl I want. I was so shocked. I just dropped to the floor and burst into tears. Finally, he showed me his true colors, and so I kicked him out. The next few weeks were some of the worst of my life, even worse than when Ryder moved to London. I felt so stupid for wasting so much time with Lucas. One night, I was particularly sad, and I suddenly remembered the framed photo Ryder had given me. I dug it out of the back of my wardrobe and held it close to my heart. My friends called me, tried to get me to go out with them. They did everything to help lift my mood up, but I wasn't interested. I just needed time alone to process everything. I thought to myself about how the only person I wanted to see now was Ryder. But where was he? How was he doing? I had no idea at all. Another depressing week went by. I was lounging on my couch, soullessly staring at the TV in boredom. Then suddenly there was a knock at the door. I went to open it, and oh my god, Ryder was standing there. Was this real or was I hallucinating? I was so surprised I just jumped into his arms and didn't want to let go. We must have stood there hugging for ages. And then suddenly Ryder said, I have something of yours. When I let go of him, he was holding my diary. Turns out Ryder had been in touch with my mom, and when she told him about my cheating boyfriend, he decided to come to New York and cheer me up. And then reality hit. He'd taken my diary? What if he'd read it? Well, he had... And he said that's why he'd come to see me, because he wanted to talk to me about it all. I was blushing like crazy. And then he said, I've always loved you, V. Even when we were kids, I've never stopped thinking about you, and I want to be with you. Then he reached over and kissed me, and I swear time just stopped. I'd been waiting for this moment my whole life. That week was like a haze of kissing and chatting and catching up on lost time. He told me about his ex-girlfriends, and I told him about Lucas and the cheating. Then I plucked up the courage and asked him if he'd like to go to Paris with me, seeing as the trip was already booked. Of course he said yes, and the next week we flew there and had the best week of our entire lives. We went to the Eiffel Tower and even visited my old neighborhood where I'd grown up. It was magical. And then one day Ryder said he had to do a bit of work and told me to go pamper myself at a local spa. When I was done, I had a text from him asking to meet him on the roof of our hotel. He was so romantic like that, 
I first went back to the hotel room where he'd laid out a black sparkly dress for me to wear, and then I headed up to the roof. I couldn't believe it! There were almost 1,000 roses laid out to form a path, and at the end of the path was Ryder wearing a suit. I love you, V, he began to say. I always have, and I can't imagine a life without you. Will you marry me? I gasped in shock and screamed, yes, at the top of my voice. I'd loved him ever since I was a kid, and now my dream of being together forever had finally come true. I guess it took us some time to reach this point, but the best things in life are worth waiting for, right? Hi, I'm Miley Cyrus. You've probably heard some of my songs like Wrecking Ball, The Climb, and Flowers from my latest chart-topping album, Endless Summer Vacation, although my most loyal fans have known me since my Disney Channel days. This story isn't about me, though. Today I'm narrating the life of a young star from the South, just like me. I'll tell you why later. For now, please like and subscribe. I know all about being famous at a young age. And trust me, no glory comes without blood, sweat, and tears. And Scarlett Spencer was no exception. Her journey to stardom began in a small town in Texas. Her mother passed away long ago. Still, she grew up happily with her dad who owned a little diner and her baby sister, Naomi. These two were polar opposites. The quiet, introverted Scarlett helped out at the diner, while Naomi, who was in high school, lived and breathed social media. Give me a phone, mine's out of juice. Man, this brick's been only to call and text for years. It should have something new. In case you still haven't figured it out, well, Naomi's creating an Instagram account under her sister's name to post pics. Give it back. I need it now. Naomi, I already said I don't like social media. What's with this photo and the Ritz-Carlton and ridiculous caption? We were just there for dad's delivery. Relax. Everybody has a social media presence these days. That photo will get you tons of hearts and followers. Honestly, if my sister ever did that to me, she would have been six feet under by now. But Scarlett let Naomi off the hook, because to her, Naomi was her bestest friend, who she could tell everything to. While Scarlett was the best sister she could ask for, Naomi knew she'd never find anyone else who'd satisfy her every whim like that. They frequented this spot by the lake for a stroll, a jog, or simply pouring their hearts out. I wanna go where culture is, like New York or LA. The only thing exciting in this town is probably a party bus that comes by every millennium. <sighs> You're a big dreamer, and that's good, but isn't a peaceful and quiet life nice too? <laughs> Bless their hearts. They have no idea what's in store for them, but it's really hard to imagine that their uneventful lives could change. All of a sudden, when their dad got in an accident and lost his job, with no relatives, the family was dealt the worst hand. Scarlett alone couldn't manage the diner, dad's medical bill, as well as Naomi. Then one day, their dad set them down, looking seriously insistent. I know that this is a lot to take in, but your mother, she's still alive. This is her. What? We got divorced and cut all ties long ago. I never spoke of it because it's too complicated. Now that your old man is in this situation, you should go to your mother and shouldn't have to suffer because of me. Both of them were too shocked to speak. Scarlet went to her room, the photo squeezed tightly in her hand. Is this really my mother? When are we leaving? What are you excited about? All we have is this address and her photo. What if she won't accept us as her daughters? She abandoned us all those years, remember? It's still worth a try. Do you know I've lost count how many times I've wished for a mother? And then this happened like a miracle. Scarlet tossed and turned all night because of what her father revealed just now, while Naomi thought long and hard about what she would wear. The next morning, the sisters got up early and went to the address on the note, which led them to a magnificent building, elite talent management. They stepped inside with bewilderment written all over their faces. Excuse me, we're looking for Mrs. Athena Kinsley? Perfect timing. Miss Kinsley's here this week for our statewide audition. In fact, she's right behind you. They were both in awe to see a woman who exudes sophistication and confidence. Naomi rushed to her. Excuse me, ma'am, are you Athena Kinsley? The woman gracefully turned around, lowered her shades, and scanned them both from head to toe. Hello, I'm Naomi Spencer, and this is my sister Scarlett. We, uh, believe you're our mother. Uh, um, does the name Joseph Spencer ring any bell to you? He's our dad. He told us to come find mom. I mean, you. That was awkward, but they got a reaction out of the Ice Queen. She was shooketh, but quickly regained composure. You two, come with me. Clear my schedule. The girls followed her with uncertainty. When they reached the elevator, everyone inside immediately got out. Some of them even bowed to her. During the elevator ride, Scarlett and Naomi looked at each other in confusion about this lady who's supposedly their mother. 
Athena got down to business as soon as the door closed. I thought your father wanted you to forget that I existed. But here you are. Start talking. While Scarlet talked, Naomi looked around Athena's office with great excitement. Her eyes lit up when she saw a photo of Athena with Beyonce. Dad needs... Did you work with Beyonce? <clears throat> yes, she's still one of my clients. Miley Cyrus, Jennifer Lawrence, Britney Spears. I've worked with all of them. Surprise! The truth's finally out. I actually agreed to tell this story to return a favor Athena did for me when I parted ways with Disney. Rough times, but totally worth it. Okay, continue. As I was saying, Dad needs physical therapy and a private nurse, but we can afford neither. He needs your help. Mm -mm, Mom? This is the first time we've spoken in so long, and you're just asking for money? I'm afraid it can't be that easy. Really? This is our father, your ex-husband. Jeez, why did I even bother coming here asking the person who abandoned us for help? Naomi, we're leaving. Sit down. I didn't say no, but I won't hand you a huge bag of cash for nothing. Instead, you can work for it. You do have a pretty face and quite a feisty character, and I have everything you'd need to get far in this business. How does that sound? That took a turn, but Naomi was even more surprised than I am. Why isn't Mum asking her, but only her sister? Her introverted anti-social media sister? No thanks. I want a nice breezy laugh and zero limelight. We'll figure something out. Without you! On their way home, Naomi kept nagging Scarlet for refusing a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. She left us! That was the first time we met after so long, yet she didn't fake a smile and even try to exploit us. Can't you see that? No! You assume she abandoned us. Dad kept her a secret all these years, so we must have lied about that too. Mom's offer is a win-win deal. Don't you see how respected she is? Despite seeing Naomi's point, Scarlet was still stubborn. The way I see it, they don't have much time to argue, because right at that moment, their dad was having a heart attack. Luckily, the girls arrived home right on time and brought him to the ER. After hours in the ICU, his condition became stable, but needed further observation. Scarlet's face got paler with every word the doctor said about her father's treatment. I'm no accountant, but this bunch of hospital bills surely sounds bad. Sis, Mom's office still stands. Do something before it's too late! Scarlet reluctantly came to see Athena again. Before signing, Scarlet had a few demands. She'd receive a fair cut of the profit and will not owe Athena anything once the contract is no longer in effect, as well as a signing advance. Also, per contract, Athena would be Scarlet's manager. Hmm, this is actually very common. My mom Tish has been my manager to this day, but that's me. I can't talk about her case. Scarlet immediately transferred her dad to the best hospital in Texas. Looking at his unconscious state, she got all the motivation she needed before leaving for the city. Thoughts about her future swirling in her mind. From the start, Scarlet said she didn't want anyone to know they're related. Athena, being the professional she was, agreed. Then, Operation Ultimate Fashionista commenced. First off, an extensive daily workout for three hours with a personal trainer. Scarlet was used to physical labor, so she didn't break a sweat. But when she found out about the strict diet she had to follow, Scarlet realized she's in hell. What's wrong with you? You make me work out, but don't let me eat? Silly girl. Don't you know the cameras add 10 pounds? You'll look like a manatee in your photos unless you lose weight. Almost forgot. Scarlet moved into Athena's mansion for her private training, while Naomi stayed home for school. At the moment, Scarlet was lonely on an empty stomach. I can understand how she's feeling, because I went through the same ordeal when I started touring at age 13. Scarlet decided to sneak out in the middle of the night to search for food. However, Athena was one step ahead and already locked the pantry. Hey, sis, you caught me in the middle of my midnight supper. <sighs> oh my god, this food is bussin'. Anyway, how's dad? I can't hear you. What's the weird noise? The sound of my pain and suffering. Watching you mukbang sure made it worse. Bye! And I'm sick of this food and this laugh. I need to find out how I can move to the city. Meanwhile, poor Scarlet could only sleep off her hunger, as she had to be up at six for training. Show business doesn't only demand talent and looks, but also the ability to handle being in the public eye. Sometimes you're a slip of tongue away from fading into oblivion. Media training was invented so we can learn to be public figures. That entire morning was spent on correcting Scarlett's posture, walk, and mannerisms. One more time, action! Hi, besties! Get ready with me to go to a ball! Stop! What now? Your accent. It's too distracting. Should we get rid of it? Perhaps tone it down a bit. It'll make her stand out. But we don't want too many risks. Risks? This is how I talk! Not anymore. That's enough for today. Thanks for coming in. Scarlet, of course, had no say in any of this. Now Athena's the one driving, and Scarlet's only in the passenger seat. Is she trying to make me a star or a slave? Can't she at least not look like Grumpy Cat and sound like a dictator all the time? 
Jeez, I have to learn strange stuff and change so much about myself. There's nothing wrong with my waiter accent. What's all this for? Sis, everyone who wants to be famous has to learn everything you just said. And the people mom works with are all big names in the industry. So cool. Mom, to her, I only exist during business hours. I'm sure she wants the best for you. How about this? Ask her if I could come live with you. I could be your mediator. The responsible big sister side of Scarlet thought that's not a great idea, but the lonely teenager in her was craving some company. So, she asked and got Athena's approval right away. Naomi coming here is like returning to her natural habitat. This is amazing. Thanks, Mom. I can't wait to see this city. I don't have time to show you around. But here, take a cab and buy yourself something. Is it just me, or does she seem to get along much better with Mom? I totally see it too, Scarlet. When Scarlet's image became much more marketable, Athena got her her first ever fashion photo shoot. But since this was Scarlet's first time modeling, she struggled the whole day, but couldn't seem to have any good shots. Let's try again. Remember, we want clean, athletic, smiley. Yeah, and she's giving dirty, tired, and paunchy. Everyone take ten. That's it! Look at all this stuff, guys. Isn't it crazy? Ah! What's wrong? Talk to me. I can't take this anymore. She is vicious. She doesn't give a flying crap that I beat myself up trying and orders me around like a puppet. This is draining me day by day. I'm exhausted. Naomi could only offer little comfort pats while listening to Scarlett's rant, but she's secretly thinking that her sister didn't know this was the life that others would kill to have. Little did Scarlett know, Naomi came to Athena immediately afterward. Mom, I want to be famous too. Make me. Sorry, that's a no. What does Scarlett have that I don't? I can do everything she does with a smile. You're only seeing this at a surface level. Scarlett's got that X factor. That's why I chose her. She's special, and you're not. That's it. She doesn't want that anyway. Who says? Show me. <sighs> Never mind. Naomi sulkily walked out when she ran straight into Scarlet. What on earth happened? You wouldn't understand. This time, Scarlet got a better grip of the job and became more confident. Then her followers grew quickly when she had a few viral videos. Those numbers translate to more high-profile promo campaigns and countless PR packages from brands. Most of her free PR stuff went to Naomi, though. Scarlet got recognized and asked for photos more often whenever she went out, and she gradually and strangely loved it. Athena seemed to be satisfied and not giving her a hard time anymore, and even flashed the first smile. Most importantly, there's more money to go towards their dad's treatment. Thanks, my darlings. The doctors could proceed with every necessary procedure, so I'll be discharged any day now. By the way, does your mother treat you well? She better. Soon you won't need to bend over backwards anymore. When dad gets better, this will all be over? Why do I suddenly feel kinda empty? Are you not happy to see dad get better? What? No! Of course I'm happy for him! Right then, Naomi saw something that could change everything. What's that? Nothing. Scarlet's on cloud nine to see all those times of intensive training, diet, and exercise finally bear fruits. Today, Athena even called her to her office. Maybe she wants to discuss the next trip, or plan to move to LA. I want to terminate our contract, effective immediately. What? What? You'll be compensated for this untimely breach of contract, which would be enough to cover everything, and... Hold on, why? You're no fit. Am I not getting more popular? What do you mean? You won't last. But it can still be a source of income. Why cut it completely? More profit for you too, right? Isn't that your sole target in doing this? Or are you afraid that I'll come back to bite you once I've made it? Watch your tongue. Regardless, we won't be working together. That's final. Tell me, are you scared people will figure out that I'm your daughter? Right. You never even came to see my frail, bedridden father. I never needed a mother like you anyway. Then a smack landed on Scarlet's face. She held her left cheek, eyes wide open, and glared at the person standing in front of her with great fury. Hello there. My name is Hope, and my life just became fabulous. My parents are from India, and they moved here when my mom was pregnant with me. Things were tough when I was a baby, but when I turned seven, everything changed. My father invented the super cool app that lets you detect diseases from your phone. So we became rich and moved to Beverly Hills. Kana, look, that mansion over there belongs to Rihanna. Oh my god, Rihanna is my neighbor for real? Eek! Man, Beverly Hills was paradise. But there was one little problem. I had no friends. We moved during the summer, so I had to wait three months to meet the kids at my new school. I was bored out of my mind in our mighty mansion. One day, I decided to go to the playground. There were so many kids playing and having fun. I tried to approach some of them, but they paid me no mind. So I decided to watch them instead from the top of the jungle gym. Hey, you there! Me? Duh! Who else is flipping around like a monkey up there? Um... Are you new? 
We're playing princesses. Come and play with us. Yes. I jumped down so fast I almost hurt myself. But that was how I met Meg and Becky. I was shocked to find out that Becky was my neighbor. Our houses were right next to each other, and I could literally talk to her from my balcony. Meg, on the other hand, lived at the end of the street, so we decided to meet up every afternoon and play till the sunset. Then school finally started, and we were an iconic trio. Becky was the prettiest girl, with blonde hair and teeth so perfect she didn't need braces. Meg was the cheeky, sporty one, a soccer prodigy, in her words, while I was the mysterious new girl, who was friends with two of the most popular girls in school. And things stayed great as we entered high school together. I was no longer the mysterious new girl. Popularity wasn't my thing anyway. I was just glad I found my place in the tech club. Hey, Hope! Meg's asking us to go to the mall this afternoon. You coming? Oh, I can't. My family's celebrating Diwali today. Diwali? That sounds exciting. Can I come? Um, we have never had non-Indians for Diwali before. But since you're my bestest friend, I doubt that my mom would mind. Yay! By the way, I have something for you. Here, whenever we're close, it will glow like this. Whoa! Did you make these? See, you're really talented. If you would, Becky, we've talked about this. Joining the tech club is enough for me. Now let's get going before my mom scolds us both. Becky came over immediately, and she was so excited. She helped us set up and helped me wear my sari, and even joined in the prayers. Everyone was happy to have her around. Diwali went great. My mother had the best time teaching Becky about the Indian culture. Later that evening, a heavy rain started, so Becky stayed for the night. We were having tea in the living room when I heard a loud bang on the door. I opened up, and it was Meg, soaked in the rain. Oh my god, Meg, are you okay? Becky said to wait for you guys at the park. I was waiting when the rain started. I went to her place and was told she was here all day. Why didn't you tell me? Oh no, Meg, I'm so sorry. I meant to text you, but I forgot. You forgot? We've been friends since we were in diapers, but the moment Hope showed up, you abandoned me. That's not true. What's that on your wrist? Hope's too? They're friendship bracelets. I can make you one if you want. So that's how you think of me all this time. Just a surplus? Meg, wait. She didn't stop, but walked straight into the rain, and everything changed from that day. We tried to make peace with her at school, but she acted like we were invisible for days, and even started a new clique with her soccer teammates. Poor Becky. She seemed so hurt. Well, well, if it isn't the lovebirds. Tell me, Becky, how does it feel being replaced? Hurt, right? We get it. You find new friends. No need to rub it in our faces. Ah, uh, Hope. Have you been shopping at Goodwill again? Are things good at home? I think the homeless person you borrowed this coat from needs it back. Remind us, Meg, does your mommy still need you to cut meat into little pieces before you eat? That was four years ago! How dare you! Was it? What about those... bed accidents? Her minions cracked up. Even Becky couldn't contain her giggling. From that day on, Meg was determined to get on our backs. We figured out she must have been mad at us still, so we decided to keep distance every time we saw her. I finally got time for myself, but suddenly Becky came rushing in. Hope, I just saw the tech teacher put a sign-up sheet for the annual national tech competition. And guess what? I already signed you up. This is the year you'll kill it. Bex, you should have done that. I'm not ready. That competition is a cutthroat. What if I don't make it past the group stage? Well, you know what's worse? Not showing up at all. So you have to give it your all and create something. You can do it, Hope. No, you don't- Hello, ladies. Yuck. You again? Can't you see we're in the middle of a conversation, Charles? I'm not speaking to you. Hi, Hope. I saw your name on the sign-up. I know you're going to kill it. Stalker alert. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Even though I am doing this against my will. If you want, I could help you brainstorm. No, I'm good. I I'll figure it out. When would you learn? Even if she was on fire and you were the last drop of water, she would still say no. Move on. You've been obsessed with her since middle school. It's not cute anymore. Becky, that's mean. Let's go. Becky later apologized to me and said she only wanted to help. Besides, the winner gets the prize of a whopping $80,000. I bawled my eyes out at the amount of zeros. That's it. I decided to give it my all for this one. I was working all night on designs, which made me so tired and cranky at school. But so far, I had nothing. One day, I overslept and was so late to school. I was running to catch the end of first period when I felt an arm grab me. Hey, are you okay? You look exhausted. I'm fine. Stop following me around, Charles. No, I don't want to hang out with you. No, I don't like you. Please leave me alone. Just then, the bell rang, so the hallway was filled with students, and they all heard what I said. Everyone was laughing at Charles. Tell him, bestie. We don't like you, Charles. Scram! I was about to apologize when he walked away in shame. Maybe it was for the best? I was getting tired of rejecting him every day. I had too much to work on. I had an idea for an app and knew that my family depended on it. In no time, I stopped worrying and started feeling confident. My app was indeed a masterpiece. 
One day at recess, I was in the bathroom stall when I heard the most disturbing things. Did you hear the thing about Hope? I heard that her father's app is a failure now, and that they're so poor they might have to live in trailers soon. Yeah, I heard it. Who would have thought that high and mighty Hope used to live in a trailer? How tragic. <laughs> My head was spinning. My family problems were a secret. Who could have told them? That witch Meg? There's no way she would have known. Then it hit me. It was Becky. She was the one coming to my house all the time. That's why she enrolled me into this competition for the money. She knew. I could feel the anger boiling in me as I moved to find her. I saw her by the bleaches, sitting alone. Great. Becky, how could you? Before I could finish my sentence, a slap landed on my face. It stung so bad that I couldn't see. Don't ever come close to me again! Don't ever say my name! I don't ever want to see you again! What are you talking about? Ugh, I'm the one who should say that! You're seriously playing the victim after insulting me? She ripped her friendship bracelet off, threw it at me, and stormed off. The whole school watched as I stood in confusion. What the heck just happened? I tried to reach out to Becky, but it was impossible. She'd cut me off. Was that how little she thought of our friendship? The next few days at school, everything started to make sense. Becky had a new best friend, and it was none other than Meg. I was so upset watching them at school, while I sat alone every day. Later that day, I was in gym class when the witch approached me. Looks like you're flying solo now. Jesus, gloat all you want. I'm out. What's with that attitude? You usually have a sharper tongue. Cut your nonsense. I know you did this. You were so jealous of our friendship that you just had to destroy it. What? It wasn't me. Have you seen the video? What video? Meg showed me a video of me bad-mouthing Becky to a group of girls, but I didn't do this. I know. As much as I hate you, I know you'll never say anything bad about Becky, which means that someone did you dirty. Oh, I didn't expect you to pick my side, but you're so right. That person must have spread that nasty rumor about my dad's business and got me thinking Becky was responsible, since she must have been the only one who knew. Does this mean it's true? Yeah, I've been hoping to win the tech competition prize and help that out. Well then, you should focus on the competition. I'll talk it out to Becky, don't worry. You do that for me? Yeah, I guess I knew all too well what it felt like to be left out. I'm really sorry about that. It's alright. Beck and I made up. I guess I was a bit jealous, since it was always you and Becky. And we've never had a chance to hang out one-on-one -on -one either. I really hope all these drama can end so we could just be the iconic trio again. Thank you. I really hope so too. One week later, the tech competition was finally here. I was so ready to unveil what I had been working on. Mom and Dad were also here to cheer me on. I walked to write my name on the sign-up sheet, and the name before mine shocked me to my core. That's right. I'm here too. Oh, meet Evans, my partner. He's one of the most brilliant inventors. My parents hired him to help take you down. But why? Why? I've been nothing but nice to you, but you only think of me as some dumb blonde. I was the one who enrolled you into this competition. I was the one who befriended you. You'd be nothing if it wasn't for me. It's about time you learn to appreciate your friend. Becky turned away. Meg tried to stop her, but to no use. I suddenly felt this weakness in my knees. I couldn't help the tears. I let them flow freely. Oh, Kana. Listen, you have to focus. Remember why you are here. If we have to start our lives afresh, then no problem. I did it before, and I can do it again. Don't let her clouded judgment tell you where you belong, my darling. I gave my dad the biggest hug and went into the hall. He was right. I couldn't let Becky take this day away from me and my family. When my name was called, I walked proudly on stage and started my presentation. Hi all, I came here because I want to tell my story. Growing up, life hasn't always been easy for me, until I found friends who changed my life. And even if there are ups and downs along the way, I will forever cherish the memories we had together. So I came up with this idea of an app called Memoir Lens, made only for you and your loved ones, where you can store and share your memorable moments with them. Best part is the app will notify you annually, so you can relive those moments again. The hall erupted with applause. Everyone loved my app and I ended up winning the competition. I couldn't believe it. I was so happy. I saved my family. Later that night, my home was packed with friends and family celebrating. I was having such a good time. But then the thought of Becky and Meg crossed my mind. So I took a walk. I was just at the end of the street when Charles appeared from nowhere. Hey, I heard you won today. Congratulations. And you're having a party. Did you forget to invite me? Oh, um, it's just for my family and close ones, so... Oh, <laughs> I get it. Does Becky come too? I heard she slapped you in the face. Ouch, that must have hurt coming from your BFF for life. Do you see how it feels now? Nobody likes being humiliated. 
Wait a minute. It was you. You did this. Of course I did, moron. And let's be clear. It wasn't because I was so heartbroken. Yuck. I just wanted to date a popular girl. And you seemed easy. But then you humiliated me. So I created a fake AI video saying nasty things about you with Becky's face. And the same for her. And you guys fell for it. Look how weak and powerless you are without your friend. Pathetic. <laughs> With all the anger and pain I felt, I grabbed Charles by his shirt and slapped him silly. I was ready to beat him up, but he scampered away, laughing like a psychopath. I ran to Becky's house. I had to tell her the truth. I banged on the door for minutes before she opened it. <sighs> it was Charles. He made a fake video to separate us because we humiliated him. What? Are you making this up to mend things? It's not gonna work. It's over. No, wait! She's not lying. I heard Charles confess. I even have it recorded. They happened to stand right in front of my house. Becky watched the video, and it started to hit her. Oh my god, that idiot. Oh, Hope, I'm so sorry. I should have listened to your side. And I said all those terrible things to you. Oh, I'm too ashamed of myself to even face you. It's okay, Becky. I just miss my friend. I also happen to know you pulled out of the competition because you couldn't do that to me and my family. I'm so sorry I even tried to. Then we both laugh away. Hey, Meg, why are you standing there dumbfounded? It feels like I'm third willing, you guys. I'm just gonna head out so you guys can have your moment. What are you talking about? Meg, you're a part of this group, and this time we're not gonna let you leave. Yeah, if it wasn't for you, we'd probably still be fighting by now. So come here, you. I missed you guys. I'm sorry I was so mean. It's okay now. Now, how do we make that punny Charles pay? <laughs> Hi, Ashley here, a superstar in the making. At least I was until the accident happened and I was left with a scar. With a huge audition coming up, my manager boyfriend Callum persuaded me to get my twin sister, Bridget, to pose on stage as me. She took on the glitzy parts of my life while I stayed in the background and recorded at the studio with David, my grumpy but talented music producer. It was only supposed to be until my scar healed, but then the doctor told me the devastating news. The scar was here to stay. Upset, I went around to Callum's for support and saw him there with Bridget. They were leaning in to kiss. I couldn't believe my sister and my boyfriend would do this to me. So with rage swirling through me, I karate kicked open the door and barged inside to confront the conniving snakes. How could you? My boyfriend and my own sister! He's your boyfriend? I, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. No, you did nothing wrong. I fell for her first, Ashley. Can you blame me? She's a flawless superstar. You'd understand because you used to be her. At least until you crumbled. I was freaking hit by a car, you douchebag. But it didn't matter to him at all. That's when it hit me. Callum never loved me. I was just a tool to him. You can't trust him, Bridget. It's only a matter of time before he decides you're no use to him anymore and ditches you. Just like what he's doing to me right now. And I'm going to make sure the whole world knows what a jerk he is. Callum suddenly lunged towards me, then aggressively dragged me out of the house. You think you can threaten me with a big mouth? Who's gonna believe you, huh? You're just a shadow of Bridget. A flawed, pathetic version of her. So get lost. You... you'll never get away with this. Just you wait and see. Days later, I was still hung up on his cruel words, but I had to do something to take back what's mine. So I spent ages covering my scar with makeup, then showed up at an event I was supposed to attend. I confidently strutted up to the entrance. Whoa, whoa. Nice try, Ashley. But the scar gives you away. Try Kylo Ren next time. Pfft. <laughs> that stung. Feeling hopeless, I started walking, and my feet unconsciously led me to the studio. I turned on the lights and played my previous records. Surprisingly, my singing had improved one by one. So I turned up the song volume and sang and danced along. I was busting some crazy dance moves when I suddenly heard clapping. I didn't know you've got the groove. Come to think of it, I've never seen you this happy before. You have no idea what I've been through. I felt safe around him, so before I could stop myself, I blurted out what had happened. He insisted on taking me somewhere fun to cheer me up. Turns out David's fun place is the super cool Japanese fair. We shared some huge rainbow cotton candy and lit sparklers and drew musical notes in the air. Then, as we walked past a stall with some fantastically colorful masks, I stopped dead and stared at them. Hey, I have an idea. I should start a new singing career wearing a cool mask. I mean, it's not the most original idea since Sia and Marshmallow have already done it, but I can hide my face and Callum wouldn't even notice to stop me. That's actually a great idea. 
Hmm. Here, this one looks cute on you. Holy cow! Red alert! Red alert! You're falling for this charming, handsome, talented music producer guy. It's on me, by the way. Consider it a lucky charm, okay? For sure. I swooned and was motivated to create a YouTube channel right away, starring me singing with my mask on and used Vixie as my stage name. At first, I only covered other artists' songs, but as my confidence and following grew, I began singing the songs David helped me write. Although the netizens quickly spotted the similarities between my voice and Bridget's pre-recordings, they're both mine. But the difference is, one uses a ton of auto-tune and one does not. Then, one by one, I released more songs, and over the course of a few months, my channel grew to over 1 million subscribers. For the first time in my life, people actually saw me for my musical talents, not for the way I looked. So, to thank them, David and I spent weeks in the studio composing a special song called Thistle's Bloom to release on Valentine's Day. Then one day, David was invited to the Grand Gala, which was a massive event full of the hottest stars, and he took me along with him. The party went off to a great start, and everyone was so complimentary about my music. I was dancing alone while David talked business with some music producer. But then, Bridget suddenly appeared and tried talking to me. Vixie, hi! I love your look! I ignored her and went to leave, when suddenly I got this itchy feeling in my throat, and I felt my face begin to swell. I looked down and gasped when I saw pecans inside my muffin. Oh no! I'm allergic to pecan! I ran to the toilet and took off the mask to catch my breath when the bathroom door snapped open and in walked Bridget. Come on, Ash, I already knew it was you. Sorry, guys, <laughs> the door seems to be stuck. She slammed the door shut and went trying to help me. I didn't want her help, but I didn't have much choice. I put my mask back on and let her place her jacket around my shoulders and sneak me out of there. She got her driver to pick us up around the back of the building and take me home. Then she made sure I took my allergy medicine. Don't expect me to thank you for this. No, I... Ugh. After you left Callum's house, he told me you gave up singing for me and that you gave us your blessing. But when I saw videos of Vixie going viral, I instantly knew it was you, and he'd lied to me. Yeah, he's good at doing that. I feel really bad for what happened, so I want to make it right. I'll give you back your place as a singer. You're serious? Absolutely. I was so relieved you hadn't given up on your passion. You have no idea how amazing you sound. Actually, I do, but I can't take all the credit. David helped me produce the song, and we're actually releasing it this Valentine. Really? I can't wait to hear it. Fine, you can hear the demo if you want. She loved the song, and I had to admit, it felt good having my twin back. A few days later, I was fully recovered from my allergy attack and feeling excited about my big song reveal. But then I went on my laptop and saw that Bridget had released a new song, Thistle Bloom, my song. I immediately called Bridget to find out what was going on. Surprised, weren't you? Now you know how I feel. I've always been inferior to you. It's about time you be the loser. Oh, and BTW, Callum and I are officially dating. He picked me over you, so did your fans. <laughs> they definitely won't be fooled. I'll show them the truth. I went online and insisted that the song was my work. But not only did the netizens not believe me, but they also wanted me cancelled. This Ashley wannabe is so tragic. I always thought this masked girl was sketchy. She thought she was so sleek stealing Ashley's song. I had to watch my subscriber count take a nosedive. All my hard work had gone to waste. I turned my phone off and just sat in a dark room, wishing I was beautiful again. Maybe people would believe me then. Suddenly, the door opened and in walked David. You've been ignoring my calls and messages, so I came to see if you were okay. Seems you're not. No, I'm hideous and now my career is over. Your career isn't over because of how you look. Can't you see? You're very talented and you're all set to become a great artist. That's why Bridget is so jealous and insecure. She has to steal your work. So, people still believe Bridget because she's beautiful. No one wants to believe in this sketchy, masked girl who's too afraid to show her scarred face. Look, I can't hear most of the words you just said, but all I know is you can't let a minor setback like this stop you from doing what you love. He then took something out of his ears. Hang on, were they hearing aids? My hearing started deteriorating when I was 15. When I told everyone I wanted to work in the music industry, they all thought I was Delulu. But five years later, and look at me now. Of course, it was hard for me too, but I never let my disadvantage get in the way of my dream. You, you really did it! Sorry, what you say? 
Oh, that actually made a lot of sense. If David could overcome this and continue to compose and produce amazing music, then I could overcome my body image issues and become a real singer in my own right and under my name. I started by snooping around my old fan pages and found out that Bridget was going to hold a press conference for the release of her latest album and perform Thistle Bloom. I devised a plan to get there before she did, and that includes David puncturing his own car tire and getting Bridget and her team caught in traffic. On the press conference's stage, I was shaking like crazy, but as soon as I heard the audience chanting my name, I knew I could do this. I stepped on stage, and while the crowd was too stunned to react, I quickly started performing an acoustic version of Thistle Bloom, and the crowd went quiet. I could see it in their eyes. They were moved. Then the screen behind me lit up and played a video of me and David working on the song. When my performance ended, the audience erupted in applause. I was overwhelmed with joy, but then a reporter suddenly stood up and asked, Are you the masked singer Vixie? What are you doing here instead of Ashley? I knew this was my moment of truth, so I took a deep breath, then removed my mask. I'm actually the real Ashley. The audience gasped in shock. Buzzling started spreading. I got the scar from a car accident. I was so hungry for fame, but believed I could never make it as a star with a scar. So I asked my twin sister, Bridget, to take my place. I'm sorry that we deceived you like that, and I promise that from now on, I will always stay true to myself, scar or no scar. Then I stepped down from the stage and walked past Bridget, who was trying to escape the reporters. She looked around and called Callum's name for help, but in typical Callum style, he was trying to blend into the crowd. Ashley, was the twin swapping plan your idea? No, it was actually my ex-manager's, aka cheating ex-boyfriend's idea, wasn't it, Callum? I watched him look mortified as they swarmed around him. <laughs> it seems like he's going to have a hard time with his career in the future. That's karma for you. Then I strolled out of there with David waiting at the door, leaving all the buzzing behind me. I started living my life just the way I wanted and no longer cared what Bridget and Callum were up to. Then one day, I was driving home from the studio when I saw Bridget surrounded by some thugs. I called the police and then made sure she was okay. Turns out, mom was in debt and the collectors were now forcing Bridget to pay up. My life's a failure. I try to be you to escape this pathetic reality, but got carried away and wanted to replace you. I don't have any excuse for my actions. Just punish me however you want. I stayed silent for a while, then eventually decided to drive her home. It made sense now. Bridget despised me because she'd spent years suffering with mom while I had a privileged, happy life with dad. I felt bad for her, because after all, she's just a victim of mom's neglect. So, I used the money Bridget had made while being me to pay off mom's debt, and then I spoke to dad and arranged for her to move in with us. Things aren't perfect between us, but we're getting there. She's still super shy and moody, but she's doing a lot better than she was. I learned to accept the scar on my face and became a real singer. I may not be a household name, but I guess I'm pretty famous and also an inspiration to young girls who feel self-conscious about the way they look. And you know what? I'm happy with that. Best of all, I now have a cute, kind, loving, albeit grouchy at times, boyfriend, David. We even opened a music company that judged our clients on their talent, not their appearance. I was cuddled up next to David watching the news when the reporter said there was a groundbreaking new scar treatment available. Do you still want to remove your scar? No, as it's now a part of me. My most precious timekeeper. There's a saying that goes, when you fully trust someone without any doubt, you'll either have a person for life or a lesson for life. You bet I learned a valuable lesson because that quote manifested itself into my life. It was the summer of 2000, before our beloved smartphones and social media even existed. Elio, Tara, and I were exploring the glorious Barcelona. Spain was our first stop on our trip across Europe to celebrate high school graduation. That's 18-year-old me. I'd always wanted a partner who I could trust with my life and stick with me through thick and thin. But the boys I dated were too childish or selfish to be considered trustworthy. Except for my sweet Elio. He's always so attentive and cared for me greatly, but somehow he couldn't ease my anxiety. At the beginning, I wanted us to have a couple's trip, but then I decided to have my only friend Tara join us, just to be safe. My treat, of course. Only Tara stayed friends with me after many other greedy leeches tried latching onto me for my family's wealth. Sure, I got you, girl. I was thinking you might just chicken out without me. Ha ha ha. She knew me too well. And so our journey began. Why Barcelona, you asked? Because I wanted to connect to my Spanish roots since my grandparents met then got married over there. 
Hopefully, Elio and I would be just like them. After weeks of sampling Michelin restaurants, five-star hotels, and high-end nightclubs, we visited Las Ramblas Market, and so did dozens of other tourists. Ugh, are they not seeing me intentionally? I can't suffocate between sweaty people, so I let us out of the crowd. Here comes fresh air. But hey, where are Tara and Elio? I reached for my phone and suddenly remembered that Elio had my handbag. My whole life's in there. My phone, my money, my passport. Ah, police! Officer! Officer, please help! I'm lost and I don't have my documents on me. But why did they keep dashing their gaze to me, then to each other? Oh, they understood me. Then they signaled me to follow them, probably to the police station. What? This is a hospital. They think I'm nuts? No, this isn't happening. What do I do? Uh, excuse me, you need help? That snapped me out of the panic attack. I turned around and saw two male supermodels. My, my. Hang on, time and place, Michaela. Turns out the guy who just approached me was Guzman. He's quite fluent in English and very friendly. Meanwhile, the cold one was Manu, who seemed to be watching me like an alien. I told him about my situation, then they led me to the U.S. Embassy. Luckily, they stayed to help me talk to the embassy staff, who I totally believe is the sloth from Zootopia in disguise. One eternity later, they said they'd help me find Elio and Tara, but it'd take several weeks. Ugh, that's it? What about me? I already told them I had neither money nor passport, right? Where do I stay? How would I survive? Right then, Guzman offered me to stay at his place and work at his family's restaurant in the meantime. Huh? Isn't that too generous to a stranger like me? These two beautiful and helpful people could be baits, but without any other option, I had to cautiously follow them. This was the first time I ever had to be on my own in a strange place, and the fact that their home was an old, slightly shabby restaurant didn't help. Mr. and Mrs. Rios, the owners, aka their parents, welcomed and fed me. I wasn't sure if the food was poisoned or not, but my rumbling tummy convinced me to blindly trust them for now. Then they showed me my room. That's nice. Perhaps a bit too nice, especially to a complete stranger. Am I going to get kidnapped like when I was five? If it wasn't for my bodyguard, I'd be living in a human trafficker's wonderland now. This room's only secured by a simple slide bolt, so I used all my strength to barricade the door <sighs> with this wardrobe. Whew, that'll do it. I couldn't sleep much and got up pretty early but it took me a while to remove my barricade and get downstairs. Ugh, scratch that. Or I might give myself scoliosis. At breakfast, they asked me how I was doing. I could only mutter a few Spanish phrases from school and prayed for my Spanish ancestors' assistance while their replies were too fast for me to comprehend. Besides, it sounded like they used a different language to communicate. Sensing my confusion, Guzman explained that people in Barcelona speak Catalan in their everyday life, not standard Spanish. Oh, right. Suddenly, I felt so alone among them. Unsurprisingly, when they opened, I was assigned dishwashing duty and organizing the storage room because I didn't speak any Catalan. Back home, I had maids and servants pick up after my every step. Literally. So working here was torture. Not to mention the hot weather here was draining me. My slow pace earned me Manu's glare, his annoyed frown, or sometimes a few words that I'm sure weren't very nice. Fortunately, Guzman was there to be the usual comic relief. I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. Tenada, you're doing your best, girl. Don't worry about that grumpy cat. Still, Manu was just one of my many problems. Everything seemed confusing, from how they tell the time to the metric system. Not to mention, mealtimes in Spain were always somehow two hours late. I swear, I almost blacked out from hypoglycemia the first few days. But today, Manu suddenly demanded I take a table's order. Maybe they sensed my nervousness, so they pointed at the dish they wanted from the menu. Gazpacho and pesto pasta? Got it! Call me Bear Grill. Improvise, adapt, overcome is the way to go. A while later, I was just vibing in the kitchen when I heard a commotion outside. I ran out and realized the customer from before was coughing violently. What's happening to him? I saw Mr. Rios ran up to his date, asked a few questions, and checked his half-eaten pasta. His face suddenly turned pale, and he immediately called an ambulance. Michaela, did you, by any chance, not hear that he said he had a nut allergy? Perhaps. He told me his food should be nut-free because he's allergic, but that went over my head. Thank God the ambulance arrived on time, so he was okay. Still, Mr. Rios had to apologize, and that meal was on the house. 
And me? Manu gave me a piece of his mind. Why is he angry at me? He knew I didn't speak their language, yet he made me take their order. I wish I spoke Catalan so I could fire him instantly. Guess I'll have to fire him myself. Adios. I was walking around aimlessly when Manu and Guzman found me. They said they were looking for me everywhere. Manu's awkward expression was very unlike his usual cool appearance. Sorry, you not know Catalan, I not know English. We, um, misunderstand. Go home, please, okay? Now I knew this guy seemed cold only because he didn't speak English. Seeing their sincerity, I followed them back. But will I ever return home? What if I'll never see my friends and family again for the rest of my life? The next day, I went to the U.S. Embassy and received shocking news. Elio and Tara not only had already left Barcelona, but Spain. A week ago. Why didn't you inform me immediately when you found them? Oh, we were going to do that tomorrow. They're gone anyway. <laughs> What's so funny about that, you moron? Never mind. Burning this place down wouldn't solve anything. My world had already collapsed. What did I do to deserve this? Why am I surrounded by cruel people? My paranoia was proven right once again. I can't trust anyone but myself. I relayed the news to the Rios and asked if I could live with them longer. They reassured I could stay as long as I needed. They can't reach you now either. They couldn't have abandoned you. Maybe they were looking for a way to help you. Chin up, Queen. Your tiara's gonna fall. This family's hospitality and positive energy are unmatched. Still, it saddened me that I couldn't return home just yet. A few days later, surprisingly, Manu offered me Catalan lessons. In return, I shall teach him English. He was a natural. I, on the other hand, felt like I was born with a wrong tongue. Whenever Manu got mad at me for making mistakes, I'd bombard him with questions as a distraction. Why do you use Celsius and not Fahrenheit here? Why Catalan and not Spanish? And what's up with siesta? I swear, it's like the entire city suddenly drops dead in the middle of the day. At first glance, my questions seemed to annoy Manu, but he actually answered all of them. I could see his iciness slowly melting. Time passed and my Catalan improved. Today, I even chatted with Manu's parents while working. They said this restaurant was established a few generations ago, and many troubled couples stopped by this place. But love always prevails in the end, because our food heals them all. Might sound romantic, but actually, that's because great-granddad liked being a love guru, while great-grandma wished to be a couples therapist. Since then, thanks to Manu and my co-workers, my life got a lot easier. Every time I messed up something, they'd offer help or guidance. One time, I got lost while delivering food and was gone for a long time. But when I got back, they didn't criticize me. One of them even joked that I didn't know the area because I rarely went out. So, Guzman suggested we three go to the beach after work. Some vitamin C sounds like what I need. Huh? But only Manu was waiting for me after our shift. It's uh, just us. Guzman's with his hot date. Guzman, you cheeky little schemer. Still, this isn't a date, right? Just two friends getting to know each other. I initially thought we're going to walk along La Rambla and arrive at Barcelonetta Beach, but Manu took me to Playa Badalona, which was a bit further away, but pretty much empty and splendid. Strange how TripAdvisor didn't mention this place. Manu brought out a bottle of cava, a Barcelona specialty. Wow, isn't it expensive? Are you sure I can have this? You worked hard and deserve to play hard. Aw, so thoughtful. He might make me blush. Then we toasted to my chaotic arrival here. Mmm, that's the stuff. With Manu, I got to see an ordinary side of Barcelona. Not often do I get the chance to be somewhere this beautiful. I should be more adapting. Besides, if I wasn't here, I'd never get to observe this magnificent monument up close. Leave room for Jesus! Jesus! I mean, Guzman? He had a terrible date and came to vent. What were you thinking, Michaela? You have a boyfriend, remember? Eventually, my life here got more enjoyable. I kinda adopted the manana mentality, so taking it slow became my motto. I now realized whoever invented siesta was a genius. People would sometimes burst into songs, as others would either sing along or dance to the music. Spaniards seem to value quality of life more than those in the States. Speaking of which, I still got homesick from time to time, and Manu's the only one who seemed to notice. You can talk to me anytime. Rest assured, we're all happy to have you here. Okay, okay, I might have a teeny tiny crush on him. No, focus, Michaela. Think about Elio, your boyfriend.
I wonder how he and Tara were doing. Speak of the devil, I saw them again that evening on a TV show about tourism in Marseille, France, and they shamelessly claimed to be a couple. I couldn't believe it. However, without my passport, I couldn't get to them. So I asked Manu and Guzman to go there, and they agreed. Girl, don't worry. I'm more than happy to bring those traitors to justice on your behalf. No matter what had happened, I'll be eternally grateful to them. My guardian angels. They returned after a couple of days with my stuff. But Manu said those two show no remorse as they put all the blame on me. The moment I saw them, I knew those two were backpacking. Trust me, honey. They're penniless. But I still had questions, so I immediately called Tara, and chaos ensued. Tara said my paranoia and stubbornness tired her out, as they did Elio. We kept it to ourselves all this time because we didn't want to hurt you. But actually, it felt like a relief to not have you around. Did you know that we bonded over shared trauma? That's you. Good. I hope you two are happy asking strangers for money together. Tara, are you talking to Michaela? Mickey, wait! I can't listen to another word. There wasn't even any tears left in me. Manu sat down next to me. Hey, you got rid of those traitors. Why the long face? I'm fine. Don't mind me. I just lost the only two people I trust outside my family. No biggie. Come now, it's not that bad. Give up! What the? Oh, oops, my bad. Don't give up. Uh, I mean, cheer up. <laughs> Don't laugh. I mean it. Since you got here, you've become a lot more uh, independent, haven't you? You're quite a strong, resilient girl. He's right. And not just because I like him. I'd been so caught up in everything that I didn't realize I'd been entrusting my life to him, who I barely knew. I'd been relying so much on him and his family. Maybe it's not so bad knowing good people still exist. And this guy, he makes it so hard for me to leave this place. At the crack of dawn, I woke up to the deafening sound of helicopters? That's my family crest. My parents must have sent those choppers. A swole guy in black came up to me and said my dad wanted me home because I'd gone AWOL for far too long. Then he just grabbed me and we flew straight back to America. I begged him to turn around so I could say goodbye to Manu, Guzman, Mr. and Mrs. Rios, my saviors. But my pleading was completely ignored. I was finally home and went to college, but as a different person, I was determined to socialize more and befriend new people. And no, it's not just talks. I actually moved into the dorm to be surrounded by my peers. It's been a long time coming, but I learned to open up and keep my trust issue in check. I shouldn't pass up on companionship out of irrational fears. However, I couldn't take my mind off Manu. We didn't even properly say goodbye and had no way to contact one another. So, I went back to Barcelona to look for him. But when I got there, his family said he'd just gone to the airport. Turns out, he went looking for me, too. I immediately got in a taxi and headed to the airport. As soon as I arrived, I saw the earliest flight to America had already taken off. That's how my time abroad wrapped up. Michaela, mi amor, where are you? Yes, my love. That photo album again. I'm right here. Eyes on me. Well, I couldn't figure out why you didn't board that flight. I just had a feeling that I'd see you again if I turned around. Call it telepathy. I woke up in shock to find my face covered in bandages. M my face! This can't be happening! Right, Callum? Tell me this is not happening! <laughs> right after, the doctor entered the room. Miss, unfortunately, the glass from the car window has caused extensive trauma to your skin. As the doctor continued talking, I felt myself zone out and began to panic. My face is everything! Without it, my singing career is over! Ash, it's gonna be okay. I'll help you find a way to return to the stage. I promise. Hi, I'm Ashley, and I had a dream of becoming a famous singer. I used to sing on the streets to collect a few dimes. Then one day, a handsome and polite man approached me. I'm Callum, a talent scout, and I believe with your angelic voice and rare beauty, you have the makings of a star. It was love at first sight, and not only did I gain a manager, but also a hot boyfriend. He arranged for me to perform at cafes, bars, and restaurants. It was nonstop. I enjoyed it, but I had to admit I was also, uh, exhausted. And that's when Callum suggested that I use autotune and lip sync to save my throat. Babe, I know this ain't right, but you're burned out and I can't bear seeing that. 
you know, it's not forever. I think that way you can focus on dressing up and letting people admire that gorgeous face of yours. Hearing this did make me feel sad, but Callum knew what he was talking about, so I trusted him. While the fire inside me to perform on a professional stage still burned strong. Then one day, he told me some unexpected good news. No more small gigs. The famous company Dream M Entertainment is holding auditions to find their next big star. I've taken care of everything. You just need to be 100% confident in performing. This was it. My time to shine has finally come. But then that evening, while driving home and practicing singing, I had an uncontrollable coughing fit. I lost focus of the road for a split second and didn't see the incoming car until everything went dark. And the next thing I knew, I was waking up at the hospital looking like Frankenstein and certain that my big dreams were now in shatters. After two months in the hospital, most of my scratches healed, but only a deep cut scar remained on my cheek. Just a few days more until the audition, and I couldn't show up looking like this. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Can makeup cover it? Or maybe a mask? There must be something. But the doctor said I can't wear makeup until it's fully healed, as it might cause an infection. <laughs> and if I went on stage in a mask, people would certainly raise questions. Then Callum's eyes suddenly darted to the photo on the shelf. Ash, here's your answer. Get your sister to be your double until your wound heals. Y you mean Bridget? That freak? No way! Yeah, I do have a twin sister, but we aren't close, for sure. My parents divorced when we were seven, and the courts decided I'd live with dad and Bridget with mom. I had a great life with dad as he bought me any outfit I wanted. But Bridget was a tomboy and didn't care about fashion. The last time I saw her, she was wearing all faded clothes. I guess the whole moody, loner, frown-like-she's-constipated look was her vibe. I tried talking to her at college, but she always snubbed me. And just like that, we ended up being strangers, despite being siblings. And now you say I have to grovel her for help? No! I get that you guys aren't close, but surely you can put your differences aside for this once-in-a-lifetime chance at your dream? <sighs> I suppose Callum has a point. So I agreed. Only it wasn't that simple, as I didn't have Bridget's number and she refused to use social media. You know, to match her cool, unbothered vibe. Ugh. Hang on. I remember her scowling at me behind the counter at the Yo-Yo fast food once. Perhaps she still worked there? I immediately disguised myself and headed there. Oh, there she is. I started hovering around her and explained what had happened, then asked her if she'd be my double for the audition. But she didn't bother to care. Get out the way. I can't perform looking like this. Please, this is everything to me. It's none of my business. I have work to do. See, I can't just give up like this. So I ordered food and sat there and waited for her to change her mind. It was closing time already. I was about to leave when I saw Bridget and her boss quarreling with each other. My gosh, this is why it's never good to hire teenagers. I only hired you because you begged for the job. I I'm sorry, sir. I'll... <sighs> Darn it. Starting today, you will work without pay for three months. No, sir, I need money. You didn't even pay me last month. Hey, what are you doing? Go. You can work elsewhere. Don't be here with a scumbag. What? And you get lost before I report you to the cops. What you aiming at? Why do you have to work here anyway? Doesn't mom give you a big enough allowance? Don't pretend like you care. How could a spoiled girl like you ever understand? What do you mean by that? Ugh. Anyway, you need money, right? I can help you. Bridget didn't answer, but I saw through her Miss Frosty persona. If you replace me until I'm recovered, then I'll pay you. A big check worth ten times what you're making here. By the way, only two of us and my manager know about this, so don't worry. Then I gave her my number and told her to message me when she made a decision. She reluctantly took it, saying nothing, and just left. But that evening, a message from an unknown number popped up. Okay, I'm in. You better pay me right. I immediately called Callum and told him the good news. Now it's time to turn Bridget into a temporary me. Normally, Callum and I keep our relationship low-key to maintain professionalism. And that's the same now. We're keeping it a secret with Bridget. Callum made it clear to Bridget that all she needed to do was to look pretty and lip-sync. But geez, that girl could only moan. This crop is too tight and constricting. 
Stop scratching like a monkey. I showed her how to stand straight and walk like a diva. And it shocked me when she said she'd never heard of skincare. No wonder her skin was as dry as the Sahara Desert and her pores were as deep and large as black holes. No worries. The witches here will give you a magic transformation. Wow. She looked exactly like me, just without the wound. <sighs> Even Callum was impressed. He instantly offered to help her into the car and drive her to the audition. Mm, I guess it made sense for Callum to keep her on our side. Now is not the time for stupid jealousy, Ashley. I disguised myself as Bridget's assistant and nervously waited backstage. The audition was such a nightmare. Bridget's lip syncing didn't match the pre-recorded audio, and she danced like she had two left feet. Finally, the performance ended, and the first judge to comment was David Knight, a.k.a. the music wizard, master composer, and lord of melodies. Oh, I know this guy. He's sure a demigod in real life. Your singing was dismal, and your dancing was catastrophic. Did you get lost looking for the bathroom and wander on stage by accident? Having a pretty face isn't enough to keep you here. The judge sitting next to David suddenly grabbed a mic. Wait, he's the CEO of Dream M. <clears throat> Uh, you're wrong, David. Beauty is also talent. She's a diamond in the rough and only needs a little polishing to shine. After the show, Callum was overjoyed as he informed Bridget that she'd become a talent at Dream M and would soon become an A-lister. I was so excited, too, that I flung my arms around Bridget, but she coldly pushed me away. Enough for today. Since then, the three of us agreed that Bridget would perform on stage while I would record at the studio. The bad side was about putting up with David, the difficult judge at the audition who was in charge of my recording session. The only thing going for you is your face, so why hide it behind that mask? If you must know, I didn't have time to apply any makeup. Satisfied much? Sorry, what you say? It was too early in the day to deal with such a jerk, so I stayed silent and focused on the session. Hmm... Your singing has improved significantly since the audition. It just still lacks some emotion. Haha, <laughs> thanks. My debut was just days away, but things didn't go so well. Bridget had no sense of style and appeared in the fashion column Worst Dress Lists, shaking like a leaf on stage and jumbling her words when facing impromptu interviews. So I had to set up a crash course for Bridget, but this time I taught her simple, easy-to-remember things instead of big stuff like last time. I showed her how to pair basic outfits, how to deal with the press, and most importantly, I still guaranteed her regular pay. Ash, you, um... You've helped me a lot, and I, anyway, so, uh, thanks. Oh my, she was so awkward, but that was sweet. I could gradually feel that we were actually sisters. Bridget, the main effort was still yours. Keep it up. Soon, the company began to promote Bridget, and her reputation skyrocketed. All the while, my relationship with Callum took a nosedive. At previous events, Callum used to pamper me and bring me my favorite foods. But now he just brought Bridget's favorites. He never left her side, and they were always having cozy chats. So one day, I decided to talk straight to him about this. Callum, I have to admit that I feel kind of uncomfortable, as you're a bit too close to Bridget. Babe, I got you. I have to pretend I'm with Bridget as everyone thinks she's you. I'm doing this for your own good, so stop overthinking. Will you do it for me? I know, but I really feel insecure since I got this scar. It's like I've lost everything. Don't worry, the scar will eventually heal. The most important thing right now is you stay calm and get through this time. Ah, right. I suddenly forgot that I was working for a greater goal. I tried convincing myself that they were just dedicated to their work and that my wound would be healed soon and I could go back to being me. I still go to the hospital every week for follow-up and treatment. It's faded, hasn't it? I needed to escape, so I went to the studio to sing my heart out. I was certain no one would be there at this time of night, but turned out I was wrong. Surprisingly, on seeing me, that dude didn't shoo me away. Instead, he was actually pleasant. A night owl too, huh? Start singing then. I'll give you my valuable opinions. I was shocked by this approachability, but I rolled with it. David was many things, but there was no denying he was extraordinarily talented that made huge hits. I sing, and he gave me some useful tips and pointers. I believed you'd be too haughty to listen to my guidance, but it turns out I was mistaken. Well, I found you annoying at first, but I appreciate your help and I value your feedback. 
It seems there's actually a nice guy behind the ogre front. S sorry, what you say? I won't say it twice. Then I started humming a few lines from a song I'd written, but didn't realize I was singing it out loud until it was too late. That song is good. Whose is it? Uh, actually, I wrote it. No need to be mocking. No, I'm not at all. I didn't know you had a talent for songwriting. Come here. Let me hear the whole song. So we sat down together, and surprisingly, our vibe matched each other perfectly. Actually, you're the first person to take my ability seriously. Sorry? Hey, stop pretending! Actually, I'm not pre- Gradually, Bridget seemed to figure out how to act like me, and her popularity grew. She was no longer sluggish and paid more attention to her appearance. Even Callum mentioned how he could only distinguish us by my wound. From then on, Callum said Bridget could do it herself, so they went to the shows without me. This feeling is making me squirm. On the one hand, I want Bridget to do well to help me out. On the other hand, I'm also feeling a bit resentful that I was replaced so easily. I also miss the way Callum used to care about me. But I remember what he said the other day, and I know I shouldn't be acting like a child. So I tried to distract myself by doing what I love the most, singing. Everybody was packed with Bridget's show, so this world is mine. Woohoo! I was in the studio practicing my new song when suddenly David barged in. Can you explain to me why you're here whilst also performing on TV live? W why are you here? Does it even matter now? Who really are you? I begged him to keep quiet. Then I frantically took my mask off and told him everything. I mean, everything. As I was too shocked to make any excuses. This is insane. I know it isn't right, but, but I, I promised once my wound healed, everything would go back to normal. Singing is everything to me. David remained silent for a while, then blurted out, All right, if what you said is true, I will keep your secret. And one more thing, if you really like singing and songwriting, I can continue to help you. What do you say? Y yes, yes, totally, yes. And don't you dare lie to me. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Yeah, swear to God. Finally, it was the follow-up day. As the doctor finished the examination, I saw him frown. I'm sorry to inform you that the scar cuts too deep. It may fade over time, but I'm afraid it won't go completely. At least in two years. I broke down. This couldn't be happening. <laughs> Not knowing what else to do, I decided to go and find Callum. But when I arrived at his house, I saw that he wasn't alone. Bridget and Callum were sitting together and slowly leaning for a kiss. It was a regular morning, and I was sorting my books out in my locker when excited screams and cheers distracted me. Huh? It was way too early for this level of noise. A group of girls was lingering around the bulletin board. I walked over to take a look. Turns out, it was just the latest poster of Hillary, the prettiest girl in school for her campaign of becoming prom queen. <sighs> well, yeah. Typical reaction, since Hillary alone is too perfect already. All day, I found myself thinking about the Queen Hillary poster. Oh, I wish I could be as beautiful as she is. I mean, I'm not that ugly, but damn sure I'm not beautiful like her. OMG, look at me. My cheekbones aren't defined enough. My lips aren't pumped enough. My hair is too frizzy and I literally have to jump on the spot to get myself into my favorite pair of jeans. Ugh, let's face it, I was plain and ordinary, while Hillary, she was oh so beautiful. Mom called me down for dinner, so I sat there glumly twirling my fork around my plate. Mom must have noticed something was up, as frowning she asked me, Sonia, what's wrong? You've barely touched your dinner. I'm not hungry. I sighed out. Anyways, I'm big enough already. And ugly enough. Sweetie, don't be silly. You look lovely. Yeah, right. Mom was only saying that because she felt like she had to. I thanked her for dinner, then went back to my room and scrolled through Hillary's profile. There wasn't one bad picture of her. Not one! She was so flawless. While I was, well, full of flaws. The next day, I was hanging out on the school field with my best friend Sydney and my boyfriend Lucas when Hillary passed by in a stunning dress. Jeez, look how gorgeous she was. Earth to Sonia. Sydney threw a potato chip at me. I turned and gave her a what was that for look. 
She rolled her eyes and continued, Stop staring at Little Miss Popular and pay attention to us. You know, your actual friends? Hello? Sorry, I sighed. It's just that she looks so pretty in that dress. It's not fair. She doesn't even have to try. Well, on me, it'd look like I was wearing a garbage bag. Stop comparing yourself to her. It's dumb. Yeah, Hillary's Hillary. You are you. And you have your own beauty. I shook my head. Yeah, right. I didn't have any beauty. Instead, I was ordinary, while Hillary was extraordinary. Chemistry was the only class I shared with Hillary. And for that entire 45 minutes, I just couldn't stop staring over at her, transfixed. As the teacher droned on about the periodic table, I daydreamed about how amazing it would be to have hair as glossy, skin as clear as hers. I caught her staring back at me a couple of times, and one time she mouthed, What? Then rolled her eyes and annoyedly turned away. But still, I couldn't take my eyes off of her. After the lesson, I followed her to her next class, even though it was in a different direction to where I needed to be. I watched on with envy as her boyfriend, Ethan, the captain of the basketball team, looked at her adoringly, and how her pretty friends flocked around her. It must be so awesome to be that perfect. My Hillary obsession continued at home. Each evening, I scrolled through her profile and saved any new pics she'd posted. Then I'd just lay in bed staring at her perfect features and comparing them to my not-so-perfect ones. I even printed out my fave pics of her and framed them on my desk. (sighs) Then one day, my worst nightmare came true. I was on my way to meet Lucas when I saw him standing in the hallway and talking to Hillary. That's odd. A popular girl like Hillary would never enjoy talking to a normie like him. Oh man, look how Lucas keeps laughing then giggling. What if Hillary likes him? That kind of girl definitely gets whatever she wants easily. I couldn't watch any more of this, so I sent Sydney an emergency message and rushed off to the bathroom. She found me crying in the cubicle and asked me what was wrong. I told her what had happened and she frowned. Are you insane? Lucas was probably just being polite to her. Jeez, he's with you for a reason, so get over this Hillary fixation. It's weird. Why did Sydney have to be so rude? I wanted her support, not her backlash. So I didn't meet up with her after school as planned. Instead, I went straight home and looked through my Hillary photos. I cut out sections of her lips, nose, hair, and stuck them on top of a photo of me. Looking down at it, well, wow, I looked so much better. It was then that I decided I would have a perfect face like her. So clutching the improved photo, I hurried down to my mom and waved it in her face. Look how perfect I'd be if I changed a few things. Please will you lend me the money to pay for surgery? Please? Mom looked horrified. Sonia, you're only 17 and you're already beautiful. You don't need to put yourself through all this pain and risks to look like someone else. I tried explaining to her that I didn't want to continue my life looking as plain and boring as I did, but she didn't listen at first. It took me a lot of time to talk her through, and let's face it, she also has had a nose job before. So what's the big deal about me getting mine fixed too, along with a few more touch-ups? That summer, I lied to Sydney and Lucas that I was spending the whole holiday with my dad and stepmom. I showed the surgeon a photo of Hillary as an example of the results I wanted. So he narrowed my nose, inserted cheek implants to give me a more defined look, and injected my lips with filler. I woke up after surgery in agony. Oh dear God, it hurts. I couldn't talk, and even crying was painful. Worse still, with all the bandages, I resembled an Egyptian mummy. Then, when the bandages were removed, My face was all swollen and puffy, and I had to do these massages to improve my facial muscles again. Pain is beauty, and beauty is pain, isn't it? Mom wasn't exactly impressed with what I did, as I didn't really tell her I would change my entire face. Still, 
she spent the summer looking after me, even though I did have to put up with her whining and sometimes even tears. Once healed, all that was left to do was have my hair colored and cut like Hillary's and change my style to match hers. With my new look complete, I looked at the mirror and smiled. Finally, I was beautiful. I returned to school excited for everyone to see my new look, but as I walked through the hallway, everyone stared and gossiped about me. People I didn't know surrounded me and bombarded me with questions such as, which parts did you fix? How much? And did it hurt? Nobody actually complimented me or anything. Then, as I was sorting out my locker, I heard a cough. I looked up to see Sydney standing there with her arms folded. So, was it worth it? I wasn't in the mood for this, so I replied, You can't say anything nice, can you? This is who I am now. I'm being my true self, and I'm happy. No, this is you trying to be someone you're not. I slammed my locker shut and stormed off. What kind of person doesn't support her own best friend? My day went from bad to worse when I met Lucas at lunch. He glared at me, then angrily said, Sonia, why? There was nothing wrong with you before, but now you're just a clone of someone else. He went to leave, but I held his arm. Please, I did this because I want to be more beautiful. For you. I did this for you. Lucas shook his head, then gave a thoughtful sigh. He didn't try to leave after that but he kept giving me this pitying look. Then, when I was walking to class, a guy ran up behind me and put his arm around my waist. Hi there, my baby. Startled, I immediately pushed him away. Oh, it was Ethan, Hillary's boyfriend. What's wrong? But, wait, why does your face look so weird? I pushed him off me and ran away. OMG, that was horrifying. My heart was still pumping. From then on, people continued to mistake me for Hillary. Then whenever Sydney sat with me, they gossiped about how tragic it was that she was trying to be a cool kid. It made her feel uncomfortable, so she stopped hanging out with me at school. I had to sit by myself and felt so lonely. Then there was Lucas. Whenever I tried so much as hug him, he flinched. Then he admitted that, he found my new look strange and intimidating. Life carried on, and prom grew closer. I noticed one of the Queen Hillary posters had been ripped off, and in its place was another poster of a girl named Kim. Jeez, this prom queen campaign seems very stressful. Then, as I stepped outside, I heard someone shout, Now! Then the next thing I knew, stuff was thrown at me. In just a blink, I was covered in tomatoes and eggs. Yuck! Then a group of girls smirking stepped out and one said, You should just give up trying to be prom queen before it's too late. I blurted out while taking pieces of eggshell off of my hair. What? Why attack me? Oh wait! Girls, it's the plastic Hillary wannabe. Well, you still deserve this. Have fun being a failed version of Hillary. They laughed as they left, leaving me standing there feeling worse than ever. I went to the bathroom to clean myself up and walked in on Hillary applying her makeup in the mirror. Whoa, her face actually wasn't so perfect with all the makeup on. Oh, wow, it's you. She glanced at me. You know, everyone is talking about you even more than me, she said, while covering her eyelid with tons of eyeshadows. I mean, I'm kind of flattered, but trust me, you look ridiculous. You're like the Walmart version of me. I feel sorry for Lucas for having a super insecure girlfriend like you. Then she flicked her hair and left. I looked at myself in the mirror, tears streaming down my face. So Hillary was just a mean girl who faked her butt off to build a friendly image and covered her mediocre face with a lot of makeup. She wasn't perfect just like me. From then on, I desperately longed to look like myself again. I begged mom to lend me the money to fix my face, but she refused. No more. Once is enough. Isn't this all you wanted? Great. 
Now I was going to be stuck looking like this forever. Until one night, my cheeks started aching. Soon, I couldn't so much as twitch my face without being in serious pain. Mom found me clutching my face in agony and drove me to the hospital. The doctor told me my implants had leaked and I needed emergency surgery to remove them. This happened a few months ago. Now, when I look in the mirror, luckily, I don't see Hillary anymore. Instead, I see me, but in a quite different look. I've well and truly learned my lesson, and Sydney and Lucas have been there to help me through everything. Now I know that I should have learned how to love myself instead of comparing myself to someone else. I am who I am. And you know what? I now realize that I'm okay with that. I was out for my afternoon jog and decided to take a new route. Suddenly, I saw a huge European-style mansion and had to stop to gaze at it. The walls were covered in moss, and honestly, it looked pretty eerie. I looked up, and a flock of crows were standing on the roof cawing. It sent shivers up my spine and immediately made me think of movies like The Conjuring or something. Wouldn't be surprised if that house was haunted. Suddenly, I got startled by the voice of an old lady. The mansion looks magnificent, doesn't it? I turned to look at her, and she continued. But you'd better stay away from it. Why? I asked her. Then she looked at me more closely and said, Oh, you aren't a local here, are you? I told her I was from Minnesota, but that my parents had said I could spend the summer here with my aunt. Well, dear, let me tell you. The owner of this mansion was a young girl, super rich, but kept herself to herself. Rumor has it, she worshipped Satan. Can you believe it? I asked her, So where is she now? Oh, she mysteriously disappeared years ago, and the house has been abandoned ever since, the lady replied. Okay, this was seriously freaky. My hair was literally standing on end. But for some reason, I was more intrigued than ever. Oh, sorry, I should have introduced myself. I'm Ellie, a typical high school student, but also an avid detective story blogger. I spend a lot of my time on detective story forums and have always been attracted to weird and mysterious things ever since I was a little kid. Anyway, back to my story. So, one night, my aunt asked me to pop over to the grocery store to get some milk. On my way back, I passed the mansion and instantly got shivers. I looked up and saw a light flickering in a window on the second floor, like a candle or something. But no way. The old lady said the place was abandoned, right? The light kept flickering, and I couldn't stop watching. Suddenly, a shadow of a girl appeared. She was playing the violin, and the gloomy music was wafting through the cracks in the walls. Then, out of nowhere, a crow flew by screaming, Gah! I almost leapt out of my skin and ran straight home. How could anyone live in that freaky mansion? Wait a minute, what if I'd just seen the ghost of the owner who disappeared? Oh man, I had to figure this mystery out. I could even turn it into a detective story with a bit of horror thrown in for fun. As I lay there, I came up with the title, Real Life Death Mansion. And then I realized I could even make a YouTube video about it with real photos of the house and maybe even some footage taken inside as I uncover the mystery. Oh, this would be so good! I could barely sleep from excitement, and the next day, I asked my cousin Susan to come along and explore the mansion with me. Hey Susan, want to come check out that creepy mansion with me? OMG, Ellie, are you crazy? You know that place is haunted, right? Like, full of ghosts and everything. Yeah... That's why I asked you to go with me. I shrugged. I would rather make a detour than walk past that house to get home. So what makes you think I would dare to go inside? I tried to convince her it would be fun, but she kept refusing. Oh well. If no one dared to go into that mansion, 
then I shall be the first. Gathering up my courage, I went there alone. I managed to climb over the rusty iron fence that had almost fallen to pieces in the backyard. Then I noticed a door that was slightly ajar. As I got closer, I realized a satanic symbol was engraved on the door. Creepy! I closed my eyes, held my breath, and gently pushed the door open. The smell that hit me made me feel dizzy. A musty, abandoned kind of smell. I walked into the lounge, and it felt like I just walked into some old castle in France or something. There were cobwebs everywhere, and some massive ones hanging from the chandeliers. I looked around and noticed a portrait of a girl on the wall. She was beautiful, but her eyes looked so sad. Oh my, was this the owner? The one I'd seen playing the violin? I couldn't bear to look at the portrait any longer. It felt like her eyes were piercing my soul. I headed for the stairs and crept up as quietly as possible. I won't lie. I was terrified. It was so dark up there, and with every step I took, the floorboards creaked. I kept looking behind me, as it sounded like someone was following me. By this point, I'd broken out into a cold sweat. When I made it to the second floor, there was a long corridor ahead, but it was really weird. There was only one door. I walked towards it and pushed it open. It was a luxury room. Definitely fit for a princess. And yep, there was the violin. Everything was coated in a thick layer of dust, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a picture. It was the same girl, but this time, her eyes were glowing red like fire, just like Sauron, the villain in The Lord of the Rings. I was so scared that I quickly turned the photo face down. This was when I heard the violin sound from somewhere. Okay, What was going on? The violin was right before my eyes, and I was supposed to be the only one in the house? I tried to calm down, took a deep breath, and walked in the direction of the sound next door. It was so weird, because the next door was an exact replica of the first room. Had I actually changed rooms? I walked towards the dressing table and noticed the photo in here was also turned face down. I picked it up, and it was the exact same photo but this time, the face of the girl was bleached white. I dropped the photo in horror and ran off without looking back. I ran down the stairs three at a time, but when I reached the door, it was locked. I started banging on it, and by then I was hysterically crying. Help! Help me! I screamed. Suddenly, someone's hand touched my shoulder. My heart had definitely jumped out of my chest. Uh, ah! I yelled at the top of my lungs, but when I turned around, there was this young guy standing there. A pretty cute one. Who are you? I stuttered. He frowned at me and said, Who are you? And why are you here? I, I... I could barely speak as I was shaking so much. Then the guy said, Come on, let's get out of here. You look horrified. Then he took out a key and opened the door. Are... are you a ghost or something? I stuttered. He started laughing and said, Pretty creepy place, right? I asked him if he saw the photos too, and he said, Yes, terrifying. Like something out of a horror movie, I added. Exactly. Perfect setting for a horror movie. I stared in confusion, and he laughed and said, Yup, we're making a movie. I mean, I'm gonna rent this place to make a horror movie. Then he introduced himself as Jack, a young director who was interested in detective and horror movies. He was just checking the place out to see if it was suitable. I couldn't believe it. Wow, this is literally a dream come true! I've been writing detective stories since I could hold a pen. And I've always hoped I'd become a screenwriter on horror and detective movies one day. I'm so honored to meet you. I'm Ellie, by the way. Then Jack replied, The pleasure's all mine. It's a pretty exciting industry to be in. I'd love to read some of your stuff sometime. I couldn't stop grinning. Then suddenly, another person showed up. Jack introduced him as Michael, a member of his film crew. But compared to how friendly Jack was, 
Mike was serious and intimidating. Jack could tell that I was nervous, so he laughed and said, Michael's been under a lot of stress, so he looks a bit grumpy, right? I just smiled shyly and asked Jack if I could have his number. As I walked home, I couldn't believe how happy I felt. Who knew such a scary adventure would turn into an epic opportunity? I texted Jack right away, saying I would love to learn more about his film, and I had to admit, I might have had a slight crush on him. He was so cute. I kept checking my phone, but he hadn't replied. That was so disappointing. But then, a few days later, he asked me out for coffee. I was so excited. And seriously, we had the best time. He even offered to drive me home. When I got into the car, he told me to close my eyes. Eek! Maybe he was going to kiss me. I was so nervous, but suddenly, something hit my face, and I didn't know anything else. When I woke up, I found myself in some kind of warehouse, with my hands and feet tied, and my mouth taped shut. Oh my god, had I been kidnapped? Where was Jack? Suddenly, I heard a noise outside. I looked through the window and saw Jack and Michael talking to each other. What? Did the two of them plan this? But why? A moment later, Michael left, and Jack came towards me and removed the tape from my mouth. I started screaming. Why are you doing this to me? Then Jack said, Listen, I'm not going to hurt you, I swear, but there's something I need to tell you. Then he confessed that he was a member of a criminal organization named Iron Gloves. His gang were operating from the mansion, and so everything from the story of the mysterious missing girl, the ghost playing the violin, the eerie photos, were all made up by them. They did it so that no one would dare approach their headquarters. According to the gang's rules, any outsider that entered the mansion would be killed, to protect the secrecy of the group. Michael had seen me enter and reported it to the boss, so Jack had been forced to carry out the mission, but he didn't want to do it, so that's why he pretended to kidnap me. Dear good God, this was too much! He asked me to leave right away, but I was worried about him. He said, don't worry, I've been wanting to leave for a long time, and so I have a plan. Fast forward two years. And now, I'm a freshman majoring in screenwriting. It's so exciting chasing my passion, but I still think that summer at my aunt's was one of my best yet. Terrifying, but thrilling. Oh, and as for Jack, after we chatted in the warehouse, he let me go, and I quickly packed up all my stuff at my aunt's and flew home. A few weeks later, I saw an article that said he'd turned himself in, and that the police had caught the Iron Gloves gang. Now, Jack's in prison, but will soon be free. I have a feeling that deep down, he's a good guy, and I hope that I'll have the chance to meet him again and get to know the real him better. Who knows? His real-life experience might help me write one hell of an awesome story, too. So, who knows the answer to this? The teacher asked. The whole class was silent as they looked down at their desks and scratched their heads. Suddenly a hand was raised. Yes, it was me. Just me. In fact, physics was my forte subject, so the question on the board didn't baffle me, so I gave an in-depth answer. The teacher looked surprised, then she smiled at me and said, It looks like we have a budding Einstein in our midst. All this praise was a little embarrassing. Also, I noticed that all the girls in the class were looking at me with admiring eyes. Meanwhile, I overheard one boy whisper, Where did this robot come from? I unconsciously glanced over at Vivian. She was sitting in the corner of the classroom and even she was gawping over at me. Meeting my gaze, she immediately pouted and looked away. For the rest of the day, I continued to impress my teachers and classmates. In English Lit, I recited a verse from Twelfth Night. And in math, I wrote down the formula for pi on the board. Hey, being smart has its highlights, and it was good to get recognition for my brains. I'd already been recruited into both the physics club and the quiz team. Hey, turned out this new school was not that bad. I'm Easton, and if you haven't seen part one of my story, 
I advise you to go and check it out. So, I'm only at this elite school because my sister Grace is marrying an older rich man named Owen. Then, there's Vivian, Owen's daughter. I haven't quite worked her out yet, but she seems like trouble. As the first days went, mine was a success. So I was grinning as I walked toward the bus stop. Suddenly, a girl caught up with me and patted me on the shoulder. Hey, I'm Lila. We're in the same class. Hi, Lila. I'm Easton. I smiled at her. You're so good at, well, everything, she giggled. So, um, I like physics too. I think we should study together sometime. She chewed on her lip as she twizzled a strand of her hair around her finger. Yes, sure. Suddenly a nudge distracted me. Vivian. She swaggered past us then looked back at me and pouted. Seeing this, Lila rolled her eyes and tutted out, That girl is such a nuisance. I'd recommend you steer clear of the likes of her. I nodded at Lila's words but kept my eyes on Vivian. At that moment, bump. Vivian, with her head so high, striking her arrogant walk, had crashed straight into some nerd who was walking while looking at his phone. I winced as I watched her fall on top of him, and his phone flung away and smashed as it hit the ground. She blushed and scrambled to get up, frantically took out the money from her wallet and stuffed it into the boy's hand and hurried away. Huh? What an obnoxious girl, Lila snarked. Thinking daddy's money solves everything? How ignorant! Sigh. I can only give her a shrug hearing those words, then quickly made my excuses about having to catch my bus. That night, I was watching Mythbusters on TV in the living room, when I suddenly saw Grace running out of the bathroom screaming. Her skin had these red patches all over it, and she was crying out how there were dog hairs on her towel. At that moment, Vivian passed us. She looked Grace up and down, then smirked and said, Oh my, my. Our model looks like a lobster today. Grace was so angry that she somehow managed to turn even redder. Vivian, you dare? Just you wait. After that, Grace burst into the office and dragged Owen into the living room. Oh man, it was really serious this time. Owen, look at me. I'm hideous and it's down to that spiteful child. She pointed at a still smirking Vivian. These tricks of hers are unacceptable. She shook her arm vigorously, then stomped her feet on the floor. Owen frowned at Vivian, but she didn't show any guilt. Instead, she just shrugged and said, I have no idea what she's talking about. The atmosphere in the house was so tense that I literally couldn't breathe. Seeing this, Grace continued, Honey, it's time we sent her to boarding school. The teachers there will be better equipped to manage her and help her change. Owen listened attentively, then nodded. Vivian's smirk dropped and she glared at Grace, then turned to Owen and said harshly, Dad, why do you always listen to her? She's just an outsider. I'm your daughter. Okay, let's take it slow. I'll see what's the best for you. Then he turned to Grace and said softly, Come on, darling, let's go get you some medicine. Then he led Grace to their bedroom. I thought that the threat of boarding school would change Vivian, but no. It only seemed to entice her more. One day during dinner, Owen's phone rang. He went out of the room to answer it, and when he returned, his face was all scrunched up in anger. Then he slammed his fist on the table. Vivian, you're causing trouble again? How dare you break in and steal stuff from the chemistry lab? I, I really have no words. She didn't respond. Still focused on her plate, which drove Owen even madder. He shouted, Your teacher said if you make any more minor mistakes, they'll expel you. Is that what you want? Oh my God, expelled from school? That would bring shame to our family, Grace added. Vivian glared at Grace, but she still continued. I did tell you to send her to boarding school, but you refused. Then suddenly, her eyes lit up as if she had just come up with some crazy idea. Then she turned to look at me with a smile that sent chills down my spine. Ah, I know. Easton's a top student, and he's in most of Vivian's classes, isn't he? So he can supervise her. Maybe there will be good results. What? No way! Vivian and I shouted in unison. While I was silently cursing Grace's crazy idea, Owen seemed quite amused by it. Yeah, that sounds good. No way! Who the hell is he to monitor me? Well, if you don't like it, then I suggest you go up to your room and start packing for boarding school.
Vivian didn't say anything else. Just sulked and stormed back to her room. Owen shook his head wearily, then told me to go have a little talk with him in his office. Easton, please help me keep an eye on Vivian. Honestly, I don't want to send her away to a boarding school, but I can't sit around and wait for her to be expelled either. This put me in a dilemma here. I didn't want any involvement with this stubborn girl, but I couldn't say no to Owen. Seeing me hesitate, he continued, Please, she's a good kid. She's just had a tough time and she's so angry at everything. She's so angry at me. And yeah, you guess it, I gave in and agreed to help him. Then he immediately listed off a series of tasks. Don't let Vivian get anything lower than a C. Don't let her hang out with any bad friends, including Carter, her current unpleasant boyfriend. Follow her closely and don't let her break any school rules. Make sure she takes studying seriously for once. These sounded simple, right? For normal people, maybe, but... Vivian was far from normal. Instead, she was troublesome, cunning, and uncooperative. I had no idea how I was going to convince a rebel like Vivian to abide by any of these rules. But I told Owen I'd help. So now I had to stick to my word. So from then on, I officially became Vivian's tutor and butler. I had to tutor her every day, keep an eye on her 24-7, and of course, put up with her mischievous pranks to escape my management. Please, focus! Why do you keep on staring out the window and daydreaming when the exams are right around the corner? I got really mad at Vivian. I don't want to, but I have a headache, so I just can't concentrate. She wasn't fooling me with that fake pity face. I immediately pulled a tablet of aspirin out of my shirt pocket and tossed my head to signal her to take it so that she could keep studying. Vivian was dumbfounded, picked up her pen, and started doing the homework. But within just less than five minutes, she turned to me and asked, Hey, Easton, do you like playing games? I flipped the pages of the book and reluctantly said yes. Clearly, she was just waiting for that, as she immediately took out her Nintendo Switch, excitedly gave it to me and said, So you can play this, and I'll sleep for a bit. I stayed up so late last night watching movies. Hmm. When the time's up, just tell my dad that we finished studying. Before I can say anything, she'd already jumped onto her bed and wrapped herself in blanket. Ugh, so frustrating. But then an idea popped in my head. Well, then let's change the learning method. Language shower. How does that sound? Then I reached for the mini speaker on the table, played a Spanish audio lesson at the highest volume and placed it right by her ears. She quickly covered her head with a pillow, but I didn't give up and continued pushing the speaker close. After rolling around in bed for a while, she finally admitted defeat, and with a frowning face, went back over to the desk and said, Okay, just stop this crazy torture right away, please. You want me to sit here and study, right? I folded my arms and smiled smugly. Ha, this girl is not that hard to handle. I didn't share Vivian's carefree attitude. Instead, I was so anxious that she would fail her exams and I'd get the blame. I even had to beg her, Hey, please, focus on studying literature, please. If you get an F, then I will be dead meat. Huh? That's none of my business, Vivian sneered. I desperately passed her my essay. Here, I've already prepared this for your reference. You just have to memorize it. She quickly scanned it once, then dropped it down on the table and replied, Nah, you can learn it by yourself. I have better things to do. Helplessly, I picked up the essay and read it out loud. I read it again and again, with the hope that while she was polishing her nails, she could remember a few sentences. At first, Vivian seemed annoyed, but then she giggled and said, Okay, let me learn on my own. Your poor face looks so funny. What a miracle! She actually started reading through the notes, but to be honest, I didn't expect much. But you know what? The most unexpected thing happened. When we were standing outside of the school gates, she showed me her exam results. B's and C's, and not one D. Man, this felt even better than when I got an A+. Well, almost. I was about to congratulate her when I heard someone shout her name. Then I turned around to see some kids walking over to her. Oh no. Were these the bad influences Owen told me to keep her away from?
This shift was boring. So as I handed the two coffees over to the girl, I couldn't help but daydream about what to have for lunch. Um, excuse me, why the attitude? The girl sounded annoyed. Then before I could say anything, she shouted, I want to speak to your manager. The boy next to her tried to keep her calm and asked her to go outside first. Then he said to me, I'm sorry about my sister. I mumbled, it's okay, as I handed him $20 change. Oh, just keep it, he smiled. But then he started apologizing, took the change, then left. What just happened? I took out my phone to check my face. Oh, great. I looked like I was sucking on wasps. And all because I was thinking about whether I should have pasta or a sandwich. (sighs) Well, to be honest, what just happened wasn't new to me, but it never seemed to get any easier. Let me start at the beginning. So, I'm Isabel. I just graduated from high school and was soon to be a freshman at college. Ever since I can remember, my parents, friends, and teachers always asked me the same questions, such as, what's wrong? And why the long face? When I told them that I was fine, they would always be like, are you sure? Or, if there's a problem, you need to tell us, okay? Oh, it was so frustrating. There was even this one time where my teacher had to stop in the middle of a lesson to ask me not to look at her like that because my stare made her feel uncomfortable. What? I was just really focused. Then I eventually found out in high school. It was on a normal sunny day. I was sitting at the bus stop with my best friend Jocelyn when some guy came over and asked for directions. I looked up and the guy got startled and began to stutter. Oh, sorry for for bothering you. And then he left in a hurry. Huh? This was so confusing. He didn't even give me a chance to get a word out. So I turned to Jocelyn and asked if she might know what the guy's problem was. Um, maybe it's because you look like you want to kick his butt. Then she told me how everyone at school thought I was an arrogant snob. What? That was ridiculous. Why would they think of me like that? I asked her this, and she took out a mirror and held it to my face. Well, see it for yourself. I took a deep look in the mirror, and oh my god, she was right. I did look a bit moody, but I swear I wasn't. Not at all. The next day... Jocelyn sent me a link to an article. It was about people having a naturally grumpy face, also known as resting bee face, a.k.a. RBF. You know the word. No wonder nobody likes me and wants to be friends with me. Well, except Jocelyn, thank God. She saw beyond my sullen-looking exterior. I wanted college to be different, so I was determined to say goodbye to snobby Isabel and say hello to happy, joyful Isabel. I just needed to smile all the time. Sounds easy, right? So on my first day at college, I walked into the lecture hall with the biggest smile fixed on my face. I hoped I looked friendly and not like that creepy cat from Alice in Wonderland. But then my smile immediately vanished when I saw him. It was the guy who wanted to tip me $20 and then ran off with it. Ugh, why was he here? I was trying to come across as a sweet, friendly girl and I didn't need him spreading rude rumors about me. So the easiest solution was to avoid this guy as much as possible. Only the universe had other ideas, and I found myself stuck doing a group project with him. Ugh, great. We all sat in a circle, and I found out he's called Carter. Our group leader, Carla, assigned each of us a task. While listening to her, I tried to hold my smile as brightly as I could. Keep it steady. Steady! I thought to myself over and over, but you know what? Fake smiling is hard work, and it causes serious face ache. Then my cheek started twitching, so to avoid looking like a weirdo, I decided to take a break from smiling. And that's when Carla noticed me and asked, Did I say something wrong? Everybody was gawping at me. I could feel myself blushing. Great, now I probably resembled a grumpy tomato. That's when Carter spoke up. Just continue. We'll say if anything's unclear. Thank you, Carter. Now, I know how Lewis Lane felt after being rescued by Superman. This felt even more intense than the movie. And oh, he was actually kind of cute, too. I felt a little bummed out after the group meeting. All I wanted to do was make some friends, but 
I'd already given Carla the wrong impressions about myself. <sighs> I'm not a big party goer, but perhaps the big freshman party happening on Friday would be a good place to make friends, right? Feeling down, I sat on the side of the bench by the college sports field and just looked up to the sky. Then I noticed Carter playing soccer with some guys. So I watched him play for a bit. It could have been the lighting, or the fact he looked so hot when sweaty, but I couldn't take my eyes off him. Maybe I should try talking to him. The next day, I walked into the lecture hall and spotted Carter sitting alone, reading a book. This was my chance. I could sit next to him and start a convo. Okay, Isabel. Keep it cool. Oh no, not cool. Cool means arrogant. Keep it happy. You got this. Smile on. Check. Hi, is this seat... Carter looked up. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know this was your seat. Then he gathered his stuff and moved to another table. What? Ugh, curse you, RBF. I wasn't giving up this easily, so I searched online and read that makeup could help fix my situation. So I applied makeup around my mouth and eyes, then went to my lecture. Only during the group discussion, Carter whispered to me, Are you sick? As you look a bit pale. Why don't you go home? I can take notes for you. After hearing him say that, I actually did feel a bit sick. Sick of the constant failure. But wait, this Friday was the party. That would be my last opportunity to make friends and talk to Carter. I'd never been to a party before, mainly because no one had ever invited me to one. Pretty sure they thought my grumpy look would kill the mood. <sighs> so I spent ages deliberating on an outfit, opting for a bright colored dress to make me look more cheerful. As I walked into the party, I couldn't stop shaking. Everyone looked like they were having a great time, while I just looked like a grumpy kid longing for their mama. It's okay, Isabel. Keep calm, I told myself. I just needed a couple drinks to boost my confidence. So, I got a couple of shots from the bar, and wow, I immediately felt like a whole new person. I was about to bravely talk to some girls when suddenly a guy came over to me and said, Hey, looks like you're having a bad time. If you don't like these things, I think you should just go home. It's okay. Great. If even alcohol couldn't help me, then what else could? I lost all interest in making friends, so I decided to take the random guy's advice and leave. Everyone would have far more fun without having to see my moody face anyway. As I hurried out of there, I heard someone shout, Isabel, wait up. I turned around and saw that it was Carter. He caught up with me and asked why I was leaving so early. I muttered out how partying wasn't really my thing and I'd rather hang out somewhere else. Yeah, I'm not so keen on them either. Can I come with you? I froze for a minute, but I guess he presumed I was angry with him as he apologized and went to leave. Oh, hell no. No way am I gonna let him slip away again. So I said quickly, Of course you can come! but it came out as loud screaming. The poor guy must have felt like a tiger was growling in front of his face. Well, at least he was still coming with me, right? Even if it was out of fear, he looked a little unsure as I led him toward one of my favorite places, which was underneath this bridge, but when he saw all of the awesome graffiti, he seemed to be more at ease. He had fun, looking from one piece to the next. Then we started talking, and turns out we could get on pretty well. We soon became close friends, and I even introduced him to Jocelyn. The more I spent time with Carter, the more I liked him, and I started to think that he liked me too. Don't ask me why. It's just a gut feeling. Then one day I opened the door to see Carter standing there with his huge bouquet and a cute gift box. Oh, sweet lord. Were they for me? I knew I needed to say something, so I mumbled out, Who is that for? Ouch. Did that sound a bit harsh? Should I ask again? And maybe with a softer voice and a smile. But before I could say anything, Carter replied, Um, oh, these are for Jocelyn. Can you please give them to her? Thanks. He handed me them, then ran off. What? Carter was in love with Jocelyn? But hey, it's no shocker that good things never happen to me, and someone with a naturally joyful look like her would get all the guys. Let's face it, who wants a mean-looking girlfriend? This sucked. After that, I purposefully avoided Carter, and we didn't talk at all for a week. It was all too much. So one day after lectures, I went to my happy place under the bridge. What? 
There was this new graffiti drawing. It was huge, ugly, and I think it was for me. As in dried, dripping letters, it said, I love you, Isabel. I stared at it, open-mouthed. Was this someone's idea of a joke? Then someone came up alongside me. It was Carter. It's not my finest work, but I tried, he said coyly. Huh? He did this, but why? Then he continued, The flowers and gift were for you, but I thought you were annoyed, so I freaked out and said they were for Jocelyn. So afterward, I called her and told her the truth, and she said that you like me too. Now that explains the weird looks Jocelyn has been giving me. I was so having words with her later. <laughs> you know, I drew that a week ago. I've been following you every day after college. Um, not in a, in a creepy way. I just wanted to be here when you first saw it. And oh man, it was so worth it. Then he gave me the cutest smile and pulled me in for a hug. Oh, wow. This guy knew how to make a girl melt. And you know what? I was smiling, and I wasn't forcing it. So that's it. We became an official couple. Turns out he doesn't care if I have a RBF or not, as he took the time out to discover the real me. You should never judge a book by its cover, as you might miss out on the best adventure ever. So, if that girl or guy looks a bit miserable, then maybe you shouldn't rule them out as being arrogant and moody, and instead, give them a chance.